If you were to walk outside and see a person digging a hole in the dirt in your front yard, your reaction would depend a lot on why they were doing it. If, for instance, it was the plumber you'd hired to fix your home, you might feel grateful. Their purpose was to help you fix your old clogged pipes, after all. If it was a child in your care who cheerfully told you they wanted to dig a hole all the way to the center of the earth, you might be endeared by their imagination. You might even lend a shovel and make it a bonding activity. But if there was no apparent purpose and the stranger just kept digging without explaining themselves, well, that's not a very standard neighbor move. You'd probably ask them to leave. Random hole digging aside, underlying purposes matter a lot in our writing too. The success of a written piece has a lot to do with the kinds of strategies we use to accomplish our purposes. We can improve the quality of our own work by actually evaluating purpose and strategies in other people's writing. That will give us an idea of the tools we can use ourselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and this is Study Hall Rhetoric and Composition. A purpose has three different components. First, it's what a writer is trying to do or accomplish by writing. Second, it's connected to who their audience is. And third, it's situated in a particular context. We have to keep audience and context in mind because purposes aren't general. They're always specific and situated in a particular circumstance. Check out our other episodes on context and audience to explore that more. We also talk in another episode about the different purposes that can drive different types of writing, but each of those purposes can be broken up even further. Like if we're trying to be persuasive, our purpose can take a lot of different forms. From trying to get some specific person to think differently, to trying to get a few people to go to the movies with us, to trying to become president of a country. So today, we're going to primarily focus on writing to persuade and the kinds of appeals that make writing persuasive to audiences. In every situation, however, the purpose always includes the goal, who the writing is for, and the contextual factors that impact its success. One way to wrap our heads around purpose is to think about the purposes in the works we read or view, like this video, for instance. As a viewer, rather than say, the scriptwriter or producer, you can't know for sure why this episode exists, but you can do some interpretation and come up with a few best guesses as to what the purpose is. You analyze the details available to you, like what I'm saying and the background behind me, and when you evaluate it all, you may come to a conclusion. Let's say you watch this whole video and decide our purpose was to help writers in college to be more purposeful and strategic in their writing. There, you're all done. Just kidding. Often, evaluating purpose can be trial and error and trial again kind of work. If you realize that we're also addressing writers in the workplace, not just those in college, you might realize that our purpose is to help all writers on YouTube to achieve their writing goals, a wider purpose. Then you can start digging into whether it's successful. One of the sources of evidence that helps us analyze purpose is a set of writing strategies first identified by Greek philosopher Aristotle as artistic proofs or artistic appeals. These three appeals refer to three ways that a text can accomplish its purpose. They're named after classical Greek terms, logos, pathos, and ethos. In modern usage, they can be a valuable way to put our analysis hat on and see how a writer is accomplishing their purpose. First up, logos appeals aim for the audience's sense of what's reasonable or factual. Crucially, the appeal doesn't have to actually use facts correctly. It just has to use information that seems like or claims to be factual in a way that appeals to the audience's sense of facts and reason. For instance, let's say I write that there's a new study out about the impact of butter on health. Hmm, butter. I cite that 100% of doctors surveyed believe that eating Mooville Farms butter every day is good for your health. I'm pulling in the idea of a scientific study and using statistics, appealing to my audience's sense of the factual. That being said, maybe I surveyed only one doctor while serving him really tasty biscuits, and all he really said was, this is a healthy serving of butter. Even when a fact-based appeal is much less silly, we still want to examine what the writer wants us to do because of this supposedly reasonable thing. If the fact is proven true, we also want to make sure it really connects to what the writer is trying to accomplish. Writers don't just use reason though. 
Pathos appeals are focused on making a connection between emotions like hope, fear, or desire, and whatever purpose the writer has in mind. If we see an emotional appeal happening in a text, we can trace it back by thinking about why the writer wants us to feel this way. For example, restaurant ads that show happy moments with big families celebrating and eating the restaurant's food may make us feel connected to our own positive moments. But the purpose may be to make us associate that happy connected feeling with eating the food at the restaurant, so we'll want to go there. Like with reason-based appeals, we have to examine whether the emotional appeal prompts us to action and whether the appeal is truly related to the purpose. For instance, when a person reads a book all about a leader who has given years of service to disadvantaged people, there may be an emotional appeal involved that prompts readers to become service leaders themselves. It's hard to make people change their minds or behaviors, and emotions can sometimes be a way to kick ourselves into gear and change our behaviors for the better. It just depends on what the writer's purpose is, since if the book was still very emotional, but was advocating that we start using all disposable plastic dishes instead of washing dishes, well, we might be wise to shake off whatever emotion came over us and re-examine that idea. Finally, ethos appeals are all about building the audience's trust in the writer. The writer or the piece's topic is given more credibility through these appeals. If a writer chooses to mention their credentials, like a PhD in literature, and says that's why you can trust their perspective, that's an appeal to ethos. When we're looking for purpose, we have to make sure that claims of character and authority are actually rooted in the right expertise. A PhD in literature would be a reasonable credential to cite if you were writing, say, a video series about the origin of horror and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But if I said that martial arts are the best form of exercise and cited my PhD in literature, that's a disconnected ethos appeal. Sure, I'm trying to get you to trust me, but I'm not offering any relevant expertise as a reason for that trust. These three categories of strategic appeals overlap at times, and a given kind of writing will often have some elements of each one. Whenever we find discussions around authority, logic, and emotions in a piece of writing, we can often get a picture of what the purpose is. We can learn quite a bit about audience and context from these strategies too. Let's see how this might play out. Michael reads an opinion article in his local paper about a new music venue that's opening up in town. The writer appeals to Ethos by pointing out that he's an authority on this development because he lives in a house right next to where the new music venue will open. He uses statistics and figures to make some logos points. Noting that the designs presented at town council don't include effective noise dampening barriers, so neighbors will be impacted by loud concerts. He also mentions his daughter, a three-year-old who's a light sleeper, and how she she is just one of many small children whose sleep will be disrupted, using pathos to pull on the emotional connections people have to small kids. There are a few different purposes that Michael could imagine that the writer has. Getting rid of the venue entirely, persuading the builders to locate elsewhere, or making them pay fines if they're too loud. Crucially, the article mentions that the next town council meeting is where the final plans will be reviewed and modified in order to get approval. It'd be expensive, but if the town insisted, the venue could be required to add acoustic panels to its design. By combining his understanding of the context and time and the local audience reached by the paper, Michael can figure out what the writer really wants to do. Since Michael also happens to live in the affected neighborhood, this analysis might lead him to show up for the council meeting to call for better noise reduction, accomplishing the writer's purpose. When we're the ones doing the writing, we might notice that there are a lot of potential purposes behind our work. For example, imagine we're taking a sociology course and we're assigned an essay on W.E.B. Du Bois' work. Maybe we want to feel that great moment when we make a clever connection, or maybe we are driven to get the assignment done by 6 p.m. so that we can go have dinner with friends. Maybe we want to receive a good grade, or we want to make sure we really understand how Dubois' ideas fit into the wider sociology landscape. Or we want to simply be done with this course and get on to our summer break. What we'll find is that most writing has many purposes, but only a few that are helpful in actually getting the work organized and completed. So during invention, we can spend some time writing out all the purposes we have for writing and then identify which ones can help us come up with ideas and create a plan. Most things we write in college or in the workplace often have one of two purposes, to be informative or to be persuasive. In this case, understanding and informing people about how Dubois' ideas fit into sociology as a field of study is a great starting purpose, 
since our audience is a professor who asked for this in the assignment. This purpose can help us structure our research and categorizing, eventually making a plan for our project. There might be room for us to also keep an eye out for a clever connection that would eventually lead to a good grade, or we might hustle harder to get outside for a game of ultimate frisbee once the paper is done. But having a core relevant purpose can be a big part of getting started as a writer. Once we've got an identified purpose, we can use appeals to reason, emotion, and authority to shore up our points and achieve our goal. We don't have to use all three strategies every time we write, but some combination of them will often be very effective, especially in persuasive writing. Whether we're interpreting the work of others or planning our own writing, Evaluating purpose and strategies is a way to make sense of the many forces at play in communication. We can distill persuasive writing into the goals of that writing, and we can decide whether the strategies used are effective forms of logos, pathos, and ethos. This analysis helps us make the most of every sentence we write, ensuring that we're always moving our goals forward as writers. Thanks for watching Study Hall Rhetoric and Composition, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you liked this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.